Thank you. So you guys, you know, I think every interview still starts off with, remind us again, what's a Twilio? And so I want you to answer that, but I also want you to answer the question, does it matter that it's still the case that my friends don't know what a Twilio is, my parents don't know what a Twilio is, and does everyone, how many people in the room, if you're willing to admit, don't know what Twilio does? So that's pretty good, but that's still six or seven hands at an enterprise conference. So first off, what is a Twilio? And second of all, does it matter that there's still six or seven people in an enterprise and everyone on my Facebook feed that doesn't know? Yeah, well, I don't know about a Twilio. There's the Twilio, uh, which, is, which is us. Um, the, so you can think of us, the easiest way to think of us is AWS for telecom. Right? We are a developer platform, a cloud communications platform that allows software developers to embed communications into any kind of app that they're building, whether it's voice communications, text communications, video communications, authentication, and, and even more, we allow developers essentially to have best-in-class, global-scale communications at their fingertips as they're building applications. Because one of the things that we've found, and I had found, I'm a developer, and my background was I'd started three companies, and I was one of the first product managers at AWS, was that through the course of time, every single company that I had started at one point or another, we needed communications to build a great customer experience. And we were always using the power of software to build this great customer experience. You know, we're iterating quickly, we're listening to customers, we're shipping with every sprint, yet when you hit the need for communications, suddenly it was like, you know, the record screech. Like, you know, and, and, and the software developers in the organization would say, oh, well that's, yeah, it'd be neat if we could communicate with customers, but that's not what I do. Right? Making a phone ring is like magical. You need like telco people to do that, not software developers. And you guys started a long time ago to do this. So 2008, saw the need, um, and you guys power a ton of these experiences. So if, although you know, there was still a few hands, and there's nobody that's not using your product. So if you're using Uber and you wanna talk to your driver, if you're using Airbnb and you wanna talk to the host, that's actually Twilio. Yeah, Twilio powering. is powering those communications that when software developers essentially need communications to be a part of that app, they turn to Twilio. And uh, yeah, so you use it all the time, right? If you get a text when, you, uh, when, you're, when your uh, table is ready at a restaurant, when you made a reservation with OpenTable, Twilio is powering that. If you log into you know, Box or many other online services and you get a six-digit PIN texted to you with uh, a two-factor authentication code, that's Twilio delivering that message to you. We, uh, and we communicated with over a billion devices last year. So I've gotten five messages from Twilio in the last week, including a table, a two-factor authentication from my bank, my Uber driver this morning. No, at no time did I know I was using Twilio, and it kind of gets back to my first question. Does it matter? Is there a piece of you that wishes every time someone built in the app, it said powered by Twilio, or is it okay for you guys to be really flying under the radar? Well, what I, what I care about is that the people who need to know about Twilio know about Twilio, and developers are our core audience, right? We have what we call a developer first go to market, where the developer is the first person usually to bring Twilio into their company and say, oh, you know, we have this communications problem we're trying to solve. You know, we're trying to have a better customer experience and communications can solve that. Oh, I know how to solve that because I know about Twilio. We have over a million developer accounts on our platform today. And so what we're, what we're really focused on is getting the developers of the world to discover Twilio, put Twilio into their toolkit, and when the need arises at work one day, when they realize, oh wow, this customer experience would be so enhanced if we actually had good communications, hey, let me prototype that. And I can spend half an hour building this prototype of a new communications experience and then show it off to my product manager or my you know, vice president or whoever it is who might be the you know, decision maker in that scenario, say, hey, check this out, like I built this. And what we've seen time and time again is when developers have the ability to do that, build a prototype with very little friction, with like no upfront cost, and show it in front of people and say, hey, I've got this idea and actually I prototyped it, check it out, that prototype often turns into a beta, and a beta often turns into production, and that's how these ideas come to fruition. And that's what's really cool about the era of, of, of the world and the era of software that we're in right now, which is a developer with a text editor can change the world. Which is obviously a big shift. Let's also talk about the broader implications of what you do and what it means that what you do exists. So, you know, on the one hand, 
you know, I could call somebody or text somebody before, you know, I was moving maybe to a desk phone from my computer, but that's actually kind of a big deal. Talk about why it matters that instead of using Salesforce and then moving to my phone, there's Twilio communications in there. Why does it matter that the phone is built into the app that I'm using versus moving from a PC or mobile app to the phone? Yeah, and just to, to, to set the context, I mean, things that we now think about as obvious, but the fact that I can click a button in the app and call my Uber driver, uh, as opposed to, and for those of you who are in San Francisco before the, you know, the advent of Uber, right, you know what it was like to hail a, a, a taxi. Right? You called a phone number that was printed on the side of the cabs, right, 222, 2222, or 333, right? and you would, you would wait on hold, and then you'd talk to a dispatch person. It worked really well, right? <laughs> well, you, you, you say, like, oh, I need a cab at, like, 6th the Market. Okay, we're dispatching, hang up, right? And then 20 minutes later, when no cab had arrived, you'd say, like, well, what's going on? And you'd call the number back, and you'd wait on hold again, and finally someone would answer the phone, and they'd say, you know, dispatch. And, and you'd actually debate briefly, should I explain? Yeah, my name's Jeff, I called a while ago, and you realize, like, but they don't, they don't know, they don't care, right? I'm just going to say, yep, I need a cab again at 6th and Market, right? And that is how it worked. But now you've got this app and you click call driver. And what's amazing is the app has all the context of who you are, what you're trying to accomplish, where you're trying to go, which driver you're trying to reach, so that it can just create that seamless experience of you calling the driver. The driver says, hey, Jeff, you know, I'm at 6th the Market. Where are you? And he says, oh, yeah, I'm here. I'm in the black shirt. Okay, great. I'll be right there. Click. You get out this five-second phone call where you convey all the information you need in a very short period of time because that communication is imbued with the context of who you are and why you two are talking, right? And that is now making its way into every sort of communications experience that we have, of instead of having these contextually devoid communications, but you can now infuse them with the intelligence of software. So Salesforce announced uh, uh, earlier this year that they had launched what they call Lightning Voice. It's a new product that allows salespeople to make their phone calls directly from inside of the sales cloud. And uh, this is powered by Twilio. And so when the salesperson logs into the CRM, which they do every day, it can show the customers that they need to talk to with one button, just click call. You plug a headset and a microphone and you're making your call straight from inside the browser. Automatically logs all the calls. But if you think about it, this is just the beginning. Right? What else can you do when the sales system you use, your system of record, is actually deeply interconnected with the communications that you're using to make your sales? Right? It can recommend scripts. Uh, to you about what you should say. It can remind you of your previous history with that customer. It can analyze the content of that phone call for sentiment and things like that and actually recommend follow-up actions based on the sentiment. Or it can actually show a, a, a word to you saying, hey, hey, you're getting a bit, uh, you're getting a bit testy there on the phone. Why don't you cool it down, right? Um, and all sorts of analysis can now help the salesperson because it knows what communications are happening and it knows all the data about who you are and what you're trying to accomplish. It's this merging of context and communications that is really driving the next state of, I think, how all of us are gonna communicate. And that's powered and enabled by the power of software. So can you talk a little bit, I mean, obviously the Uber example, I always bring it up when I'm explaining to you guys because I think that's what people can relate to. What are some examples of people using Twilio uh, that maybe weren't doing communications before in what they do? I think there's an example Coca-Cola using it for their drivers. What are some other things that people are doing with the app that's changing the way they work? Well, changing the way they work, I mean, like the, the Coca-Cola example is a good one, right? They had uh, 600,000 vending machines. They have 600,000 vending machines across Europe. And every day, some number of these machines break for any number of reasons. The fuse blows, the something blows up, who knows what it is. And it used to be that the store owner where that vending machine was located would have to you know, call a, a dispatch center and say, hey, my machine's broken because all the cola is warm and my customers are mad. Uh, and what they did is they connected those vending machines to the uh, internet so that they could uh, machine intelligence, right, what's happening, be able to move the data into the cloud using Salesforce, and then do automatic dispatch of the drivers and route them where they need to go based on the intelligence of this software. And so now instead of uh, these uh, shopkeepers getting angry customers and going to them, right, they were able to automate that whole thing and then automatically route the drivers to where they need to go to fix the vending machines and, and do their, their route planning for them. And even in the middle of the day, change the routes and communicate those changes to those drivers. And so it really changed the way both the reporting of the, 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 the people who knew about the problem occurred. They didn't even have to report it anymore. In fact, they would get a notification saying, hey, 
your vending machine is about to break, we've already dispatched a driver. And you went from a bad scenario to a, oh wow, thank you Coca-Cola, I don't have to take crap from my customers because the cola is warm. Like, I'm automatically gonna get it fixed. And so that's where you sort of think about this notion of communications can turn a bad customer experience into a really good customer experience. So most of what we're talking about is sort of business to business communications or businesses using Twilio to communicate with their customers. But you guys are also powering some other types of experiences that I think are interesting and people might not necessarily associate with you guys. So uh, one is nonprofit. So you guys work with the American Red Cross. You work with an organization we've written about, Crisis Text Line. We had uh, their founder, Nancy Lublin, at our mobile uh, conference a few years ago. So this is sort of not the new world of work. In that case, it's sort of the new world of help where you know, in my day, I'm old enough to have, you know, sat on a call-in hotline and answered calls, but, you know, the kids don't like to talk on the phone for anything else. They're not going to want to do it um, when they're in crisis. So, you know, this started, it's a text line. Talk about what, what you guys can bring to that and what it means to have Twilio powering that. Yeah, this is part of the reason, so we, we, we dedicated 1% of the equity of our company to sustainably fund Twilio.org. And Toyo.org is the part of our company that is trying to use our technology and our people to do good in the world. And so the reason why we started this was, and this was an accidental discovery really, you know, Twilio is a platform. You can use it to build a wide variety of use cases. And we knew that when we started the company, but what we didn't realize was that there were so many use cases that where you can improve society through the use of communications. Because so many of society's problems are either caused by the lack of communications or could have been solved with the right communication at the right time with the right person. And what you see are nonprofit organizations out there in the world who are close to these problems, who see those realities and are now starting to say, oh wow, we can actually solve this problem with Twilio. And they were coming to us and saying, hey, will you help us solve this problem? And we started Twilio.org as a structured, scalable way of saying, yes, like we're here. We want to partner with you and actually help make society a better place using our technology. And so Crisis Text Line is a great example. And right? have you had to build the product differently to meet some of the nonprofit needs? Has, has the, that segment of the customer base influenced the product you build or not really? It does, I mean, in a lot of ways, nonprofits needs are very similar to our other customers' needs, including like the global reach of many of these use cases, including the resiliency and the reliability, right? And one of the things I love about serving these customers, people like Crisis Text Line, is when I think about the engineers who work at Twilio and are building our product, and who are building those messaging systems, for example, you know, it's easy to look at the like billions of messages that go through a system in any period of time and you know, think about statistically if something goes wrong, like what happens. But when you actually connect the code you write and the systems you're operating with the use case of a person who is in crisis, right, potentially suicidal, texting to get help, you, you write that extra test case, right? You do that extra work to, to test the system because you realize that actually every message matters. And I think that's a really big deal because that informs how we think about our product, how we build our product, and it also sends a message to all of our commercial customers, right? Maybe their use case isn't as mission critical or life-saving as helping someone who is in crisis, but they know that we built our systems to be able to meet the bar of that critical use case. And I think it helps us to create a better company because of that. And I, and I love that impact on our company. And another segment that you guys have that people don't necessarily think of as you guys is this emerging uh, sort of artist to fan community. Um, so, you know, that's a scenario that wasn't practical in the old days of communication. If you were a celebrity, I think no celebrity would say, I want to, you know, be on the phone. I want to pick up the phone and dial all my fans. Maybe they do one as a stunt. Um, talk about, uh, I think there's a good example of a rapper that's using yeah. Twilio to reach out to fans. I, and I don't know if I'd call it a whole segment. The segment's probably, you know, general marketing, right? How are brands connecting to their audiences in a personalized way? But we have this amazing uh, story. This uh, gentleman, his name's Ryan Leslie. He's a Grammy-nominated producer. He's a rapper. He taught himself to code. And he built an app using Twilio 
that allows him to personally connect with each one of his fans. He has texted with over 50,000 of his fans using this app that he created called Superphone. And now it's funded by uh, Ben Horowitz, and they're growing it, and they're, they're selling it to other brands and other artists to be able to use as a way of managing relationships with their customers. But here's what's so cool about the story, right? This is the power of code and the power of people to, to, to truly build something. He uh, was a rapper. He, he was signed by uh, Motown Records and released his first album. He sold, I don't know, I think it was like 100,000 albums. And then he made his second album, and he released it, and he went to Motown, and he said, okay, uh, how are we um, marketing this to my existing fans? And they said, we have no idea who bought your first album. We have no idea, so it's just, we have nothing. He said, are you, are you kidding me? Like, this is how the industry works? They said, yes. So he actually uh, quit Motown Records, went independent, and learned to code and built this app at the same time. And now he has this database of his fans that he has a direct one-to-one -one relationship with that he's able to now sell his merchandise, sell his music. When he comes to town, he can personally text like all of his fans in San Francisco saying, hey, I've got a, a show next week. I hope you can come, right? Here's a coupon, right? Whatever it is. He has this personal relationship with his fans that he built because he said, this is ridiculous. Why am I paying the record label a huge part of my proceeds and they're not helping me sell a single record, right? In the day, in the era of social media and of direct connections with your fans, I'm gonna go build the app that allows me to have those connections. And he literally learned to code, went to Code Academy, learned to code, built this app using Twilio, and he's, and he's off and running. It's an amazing story. So when I say like a developer can change the world with a text editor, it really is true. Because a developer writing some code can put an, anybody can put an app in the app store. Right? Anybody can uh, build an app and buy some AdWords and drive some traffic to the website. And so the modern methods of both building software, the ability that you, you know, you've got Amazon Web Services, right? You've got Stripe for payments. You've got Twilio for communications. And then the other side for distribution, you've got app stores, you've got Google AdWords, right? This technology has democratized the act of building software in much the same way that people look at, oh, like, you know, Pro Tools has democratized how, uh, you know, artists can make music or, you know, Final Cut has made everybody a, you know, and, and YouTube has made everybody a, you know, a new movie maker. Um, it's amazing that the same thing has happened in the world of software. And anybody with an idea can essentially venture out on their own, write some code, and if it has merit, start, start getting an audience out there in the world. So if this is kind of the, the peak of sort of human, I don't know, of creativity or development where, you know, the tools exist to let, you know, anyone with an idea do everything, it would seem that that's one sort of peak, and then the next frontier is at what point does the computer start doing it for the humans? And I know you have some <laughs> thoughts on this. Uh, you know, if, if today's world is about uh, using context plus the right human communications at the right time, whether it's text or voice, and you guys are powering that, is the next frontier human to bot, bot to bot? Uh, how are you guys preparing for this? bot world that we keep reading about and writing about. You know, it's really interesting. Uh, you know, I'm on the record as saying bots are overhyped, uh, which I think they are. And the problem is nomenclature, right? Bots I mean sort of everything to everyone, everything from, you know, Terminator to, um, uh, you know, just sort of simple services over text. Um, to me, you got to distinguish between what, like, messaging. Like, messaging is really powerful. It is an amazing way to connect a company with its customers. Right, whether it's you know Uber, or you can text the driver right um, inside the app. When it's fascinating, like this is a whole new concept. Like the idea that a driver and a rider can communicate with each other, if you think about it this way, is by far and away the largest call center on the planet. Right, orders of magnitude bigger than the next biggest call center. Right, and that's all human to human. But the other way to think about it is well, messaging. Right, do I want to connect with a brand by calling them? Probably not. Right, that is changing. What I really want to do is message them. And companies that are figuring this out, like Ryan Leslie, the rapper, who can text with his, art, with his fans, or brands who allow you to text them to communicate with them, I think will have a leg up because they're just fitting into the natural workflow and the consumer preferences of their customers. And companies that figure out this transition, how do I communicate with you in the way you want to be communicated with, they will be the companies that are considered to have a good customer experience. 
right? And companies that don't figure that out, who make you call them, who make you wait on hold, who make you walk into a branch if you're a bank to do something, right? They're just the companies that slowly will have their customers a trade away. And where is Twilio in this? Because you're powering the ability of me to call or text a human today. Are you just as interested and in actively building for a world in where I'm calling or texting an AI yeah. bot? Where, do, where does it fit in both in terms of what do you think the time frame is and also how important is it to change the product to be ready for that future? I think it's a, it's a progression, right? Um, a lot of people are very excited about what they call bots now. A lot of those bots are really just sort of simple questions and answers back and forth. I'll give you an example. Uh, actually, at our Hack Week uh, earlier this year, some engineers at Twilio built a thing that let you register to vote via text. And uh, we partnered with an organization. They, they, opened, they opened it up. It was called Hello Vote. And in less than a minute, you could text this you know, so-called bot and register to vote. It's not artificial intelligence. It's hard-coded questions and then ability to capture the response. Right, we've had that since you know, computers were invented, right? Um, it's a fascinating way to interact, and it's an easy way to interact, especially when you know, we deployed it over SMS and over Facebook Messenger and a number of channels, right? It's an easy way to interact with, with, with end users, but it's not artificial intelligence, right? And when you do think about artificial intelligence in the state of where we are now, I don't think anybody out there is looking forward to the next, you know, IVRs all over again, right? With the For those that don't know, those are the phone systems, you know, I call United, um, and, you know, t initially anyway, for years, you know, it ended with me screaming operator until a human came on the line. Now they're actually quite good. Um, but it's not, to your point, it's generally not artificial intelligence. It's just they know what I'm likely to look for. They have really good the voice recognition has gotten good and the sense of what actions people want to take is pretty good. And those are very simplistic things. Like in the universe of things you might want to do when you call an airline, you know, book a reservation, change a reservation, flight status. I mean, those are the, the three things, right? When you get into real complex workflows, right, I don't think any of us are excited about just getting stuck in the mud with, with arguing with a, an AI. What we really want is the ability to get help, and that will end up taking a number of different paths. Sometimes it's a matter of, if you think about the question and answer format over messaging, it can be powerful. It's basically akin to filling out a form, but it's one you can do kind of on the go. Right? Even if that form is long, you can do it you know, as progressively. You don't have to do it all in one sitting. Um, if you want to um, take it into a full automation setting, there are certain use cases where that will be possible and will be actually pleasurable, but it's, I think there's a, a little too much optimism right now over where the tech is today. And as is typical, we typically, uh, you know, kind of overestimate the short-term impact and underestimate the long-term impact. And I think bots and, and AI as it relates to communications is probably falling squarely into that camp. So there's not, you're not, uh, you're not spending a lot of your time in the office, like encouraging everyone. We got to you know, we got to really be prepared for this bot future. What what is there? Are, are long-term investments, mm -hmm. right? And then there's the reality of where it sits today. So, what are the big short to medium-term things? Where does Twilio need to go yeah, from I, where I, it is today? Well, for for Twilio, there's 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 many fronts that we're investing in, right? We're we're taking our services global. Uh, we are continuing to invest in the developers of the world. We've got you know there's over a million developer accounts on Twilio today, but there's 20 million developers in the world. Um, building a whole lot of interesting stuff, right? So we're continuing to, to, to drive deep in the developer audience. Uh, as far as the enterprise, what we're finding is that as enterprises are investing in software and software developers to differentiate themselves, well, those same software developers that work at, at Uber and Airbnb and all that are also getting, uh, are starting to work at the biggest enterprises of the world and the same problems arise and those same developers bring in Twilio to solve problems. And so we've got a lot of different ways in which we're expanding what we do. Some of those are about the technology and thinking about the, the nature of bots or artificial intelligence, how it's gonna change communication. Also the, the proliferation of the number of channels of communication, right, 15 years ago, you communicating to a company basically consisted of, here's the phone number, give it a call. Right now, you've got phone calls, but you've got text, you've got Facebook, you've pushed notifications, you've got WeChat, WhatsApp, anything else that goes on out there. Um, this creates a tremendous amount of complexity for companies who say, look, ideally, I'd love to communicate with my customers in the way they want to be communicated with. 
Like, I don't want it to be seen as an old stodgy brand that makes you wait on hold and call the phone number and you know, have a bad experience. But at the same time, the amount of technical complexity to actually implementing all these different communication channels. And they're changing all the time. I mean, you know, the software cadence that's coming out of Apple and Google and Facebook that are changing the rules of like how you can engage with customers using those platforms is astounding. And that's where Twilio comes in. Like we're helping customers to grapple these technologies, use them to their benefit, implement it once, and then be able to use all these different channels. And then the next step is great. Now that I'm integrated with all these different channels of communication, can I, can I interrupt an AI? Can I make it the same AI that works across Facebook and SMS and you know, all these other channels? And our answer to that is you know, that should be how it works. Well, I have one or two more questions, but I want to see first, are there questions in the audience for Jeff? Uh, if there are, please come up to the mic. Um, are there any AIs who have questions? Yeah, any bots out there with questions? Um, one of the questions that I have uh, for you is, you guys went public earlier this year. Um, what, how has that changed life for you, for the company? Uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of the people in the audience might be at companies considering going public. Uh, is it something you'd recommend to a friend? <laughs> it depends on the friend, I suppose. You know, what we always said in, in, internally was that, you know, job number one, build a great company defined by great customers, great products, um, and a great team. And if we succeed in doing that, right, then you have options about what you want to, what you, how you want to, what direction you want to take that company in. And so what we found in the beginning of 2016 was that, you know, we felt really good about the business, we felt really good about uh, what we had achieved to date, and, and we felt that uh, the public markets were a great way for us to continue accelerating our leadership role. Because it's our belief that in the cloud, the number one thing you're selling is trust. And that doesn't, you know, whether you're a, uh, you know, a developer platform like Twilio, whether you're a software as a service company like Salesforce, if your job, if your product is essentially saying, hey, you know, company, trust us with this critical part of your business, right? Instead of doing it yourself, instead of running the servers yourself or building it yourself, like, trust us. We're going to do it better than you can do it yourself, and we're going to allow you to focus on things that are of more differentiated value for your company. Well, what you're saying is trust. That's the number one you're selling. And so for us, becoming a public company was a big part of that trust story because you're an open book. Customers get to see the health of your business, the fact that you're growing, the fact that you got a great balance sheet. They also know that public companies are just run as tighter ships than private companies. And when the stories started changing, you know, about, you know, there were all these unicorn stories. Oh, unicorns are great. We celebrated the unicorns. Then suddenly we started saying, oh, these unicorns, what, what's up with these unicorns, right? Um, there was so much noise going on in the world that unicorn was becoming a bad word and Silicon Valley and all this, like, it was all these stories got mushed up and then it's like, you know, 200 unicorns or whatever. And suddenly, because there's like one bad unicorn, everybody was saying, well, can we trust all these unicorns? You're like, this is a, what a stupid story that was. It's like, you know, can I trust all companies that somebody has valued at a certain price point? Like, like well, they have nothing to do with each other. These are all independent businesses. And so that's kind of when I started to say, you know what, like, I just love to get out of that noise get out of that fray and have Tulio be evaluated by customers, by investors, by anybody out there um, as the company that we are, not by this moniker like of, of unicorns. And that to me helped uh, me make the decision of saying, you know what, yeah, I think there's a lot of merit to going public, standing on our own, and uh, I'm very proud of what we've accomplished and I'm proud of what we're going to accomplish now with this new platform of being a public company. You mentioned the health of the business and I think you know, a lot of people have questions about, you know, where is the economy going? Is it getting better? You know, is this a tech bubble? Where do you see things uh, going for yourself? What kind of year or two are you planning for in terms of the health of not just your business, but what are you anticipating for your customers' businesses? Are you asking if we're, we're planning for the nuclear winter? Mm -hmm. Are you stocking seeds or are you hiring people? <laughs> or are you publicly hiring people and privately stocking seeds? <laughs> We are uh, planning for a lot of great growth. I mean, I, I, you know, people talk about the bubble, uh, you know, as if they, they claim there is one. I mean, to me, there's a huge amount of value that is getting created right now because, you know, mobile has changed a lot of what we can do with technology. Social and the connections that come there has changed a lot of what we can do with technology. We can build software faster than ever before. We can scale it faster. We can distribute it to end users and they get value out of it for which they're paying. Uh, faster than ever before. And this is creating fundamental, um, fundamental value for customers. Now, when you talk about future of work, right, there are some fundamental questions that I think the most recent election 
highlighted to us is that technology isn't all good for everybody on the planet, right? We have this sense as technologists that what we do is like we're making the world a better place. Well, you have to have some, some understanding of the fact that there are people in the world for whom technology probably has not created the world as a better place. Um, and I think that may be one of the next frontiers that maybe people like Stacy and others are helping to address by creating new forms of work. Uh, but I do fundamentally believe that, that, that technology over the long haul, when coupled with you know, thinking about the bigger picture of society, will create a better, uh, a better world for people and that that will continue to occur um, for a long time. Okay, well, I think we need to leave it there, Jeff. Thank Fantastic. you so much. Yeah, great to meet you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.